uh, to all of our colleagues here in Edinburgh and good morning to all of our colleagues at campuses in Malaysia, by Borders and of course to Fort uh, I'm Professor Martha Cabell, I'm Director of the Learning and Teaching Academy and I'll be your guide through this morning's keynote. <laughs> Uh, before we begin the formal session, I just wanted uh, to cover some quick housekeeping for colleagues here in Edinburgh in the room and on our campuses globally. Most importantly, we're live streaming this session across the university and recording the event. Now, the microphones here in Edinburgh are very sensitive. It's not these ones here, it's the ones in the roof. So those of you in the room, while you think you might be whispering uh, to your colleagues next to you, the speech might will pick up everything. You have been warned. Um, if you do need to leave this session as well, please note that there's a camera in the middle of the room here, so can you just try and avoid that if you do have to nip out of the session. Colleagues elsewhere, uh, please make sure that your microphones are muted so that we're only broadcasting our keynote speakers. However, the intercampus chat space is now open and uh, Rosemary and Caroline are in that space there and they'll be looking forward to feeding your discussion and questions through to us here. For everyone else, uh, Sally and Phil have prepared some very detailed slides for our session today. We'll make these available on the Learning and Teaching Academy site after the event. Um, all campus leads also have copies of those to hand if you want to look at those as we go through the session. So that's the end of the housekeeping. And let me now properly welcome you to Harriet Watts Learning and Teaching Day for 2019. When we launched the Learning and Teaching Academy only four weeks ago, um, I highlighted the importance of the Academy being a broad community that spanned the whole university. A global community of people enthused by teaching, committed to inspiring learning, and passionate about sharing ideas and practice across the university. And I hope that today is a great first expression of that. Our aim with today's Learning and Teaching Day is to open up our institutional conversations about learning and teaching, to provide space to explore the changing landscape of learning. The spaces and places we learn and teach in, and the practices and the communities of learning that bring these spaces to life. I hope through the course of today, you have the opportunity to spark a conversation that you wouldn't already or otherwise have had, to perhaps visit a space that you haven't seen before, or to take away a new approach to experiment with in your teaching or student support practice. But most of all, I hope you take away a sense of enthusiasm and commitment to teaching and to inspiring learning. <coughs> so to help us with that, oh, and I want to just pause now to say how grateful I am for the energy and the enthusiasm that colleagues across all campuses have brought to organising this event and to make it such a dynamic set of discussions. It's been incredible to see how everyone has um, how this multi-campus event has taken shape in a very short space of time. So thank you hugely to everyone who has pulled out all the stops to make it happen. So our colleagues in Malaysia have already set the bar pretty high and opened the door on the work that they do in lab spaces, the opportunities presented by the Bloomberg Labs, and they've explored the possibilities of large classroom online learning experiences. So our UK and our Dubai campuses will have the opportunity to explore those open door sessions, workshops and other opportunities throughout the rest of the day. But now, uh, we join all our campuses together for our global keynote. The session is intended to both inspire and to think creatively about our approach to learning and teaching and to provide some very practical ideas to shape our practice. So to help us with this, I'm delighted to welcome to Harriet Watt, two of the most engaging and supportive and generous people working in higher education, pedagogy and practice. Professor Sam Brown and Professor <laughs> Phil Ray. They are a double act to inspire. Between them, the list of publications, awards and accolades is immense. Their work separately and together combines their experience in senior university leadership with a genuine passion for learning and helping colleagues develop their teaching practice and their careers. They've been incredibly supportive of us here in Harriet Watt. 
We filmed it also of the In at the Deep End resource that we're using as part of our new to teaching support. The resource that people keep coming into my office to steal copies of, to take and share with their colleagues. And they're both key contributors to our What Works in Learning and Teaching guides and our series of Top Tips for Teaching films. Sally, Phil, I'm delighted to welcome you to be our first Global Learning and Teaching Day keynote speakers. The floor and the airwaves are yours. Good morning. Good evening, depending on where you are. And thank you so much, Harriet Watt, for inviting me and my husband, Phil Race, to come and share this really exciting day. And may I say how much it is a privilege for us to be part of this amazing community of practice that exists and is being engendered further by the works of Professor Martha Cadell, Vice Principal John Provost, John Sawkins, and all your other colleagues here at the university. And what fun it is to be part of it. Martha mentioned in at the deep end. This was authored by my husband, hero, deep friend, Phil Ray, and also mentioned these lovely guides, whoops, these lovely guides that are being made available to staff, which are uh, authored with our dear friend Kay Samble and other people, and they are widely available. I'm holding up the Biscuit Game Gala Shields. Because Gala Shields, this is us this afternoon. Biscuit game, we're having fun. These materials are, like many of the things Phil and I do, provided open access to people in the university and beyond. <laughs> and if you want our slides, even before um, Mark's got them on the website, if you look on our websites, mine is sally-brown.net, Phil's is Phil race.co.uk, you'll find not only today's presentations, but everything we've done for about the last 10 years available as open access resources. And frankly, if you want to nick our ideas and our slides, even without attribution, please do so, because frankly, my ideas, we don't give a damn. <laughs> Nowadays, because we're extremely advanced in age, um, we feel that the resources we create, there's absolutely no point holding on to them tightly. We think it's much better to share. And as we head towards our, our dotage, we see that our principal job now is to carry on getting involved in energising and exciting people to think about learning, teaching and assessment. And that is the basis of our presentation today. So I'm going to step to one side for approximately 23 minutes. <laughs> Although I cannot guarantee I won't join in the heckle, and my esteemed colleague and husband will then take us through the first part of the presentation, and then I'll bob up and do the second one. So, Phil, over to you. Thank you very much. Well, good morning in Scotland, good lunchtime in Dubai, and good afternoon in Malaysia. Good to see you all here in Scotland. Right, well, all of that. Those are basically the things we want to do in this next uh, um, 45 or so minutes. Eight paradigm shifts that are coming up on us in higher education quite rapidly, in fact. Um, seven factors that underpin successful learning, and I'll be referring to those briefly. And then I'll pass over to Sally for what constitutes excellent teaching. Um, we've got a lot of track record in that, and some ways in which we can actually help people to learn help them to become inspired in our classroom. And I did say I'd pop up and we are going to actively welcome questions once we've shut up. But if you can't wait before then as well. Good. Thanks. <coughs> so, eight paradigm shifts. This is a bit I want to worry you. When I wrote the fourth edition of the Bit, there was a chapter on online learning. And that's when I had the fifth one. And I thought, online learning is everywhere now. It's not a special chapter, it's grown up. It's, it's uh, part of what we all do all the time. <coughs> we don't know extremely well in the Bible of Asia, but we can talk about that. That's grown up. It's no longer something different. There's no longer chapters and books being written about it. Now, I use the word learning a lot more than I use the word teaching. 
I'm a follower of Galileo. You can't teach him anything you can only help him to learn. So I'm really interested in the learning side, whether it's online, whether it's face to face, whether it's resource based or whatever. It used to be the case that someone standing up here and people sitting in rows, it was a transmission occasion where you would write down things that I said or whatever. That just doesn't happen anymore. Students tend not to have pens anymore. They, they, they don't write right things that we say. They capture them on their phones. They get they quickly <laughs> because they have pens, right? Good. I would like to get into news. I think you can't because the receivers might be switched on. So we've got to try and find other ways, face to face and online, to do. <clears throat> We're at last getting a learning centered approach to the assessment of student outcomes. And some of you will have seen on Sally's website the vascular from creating life into learning outcomes because there were quite dead and moribund to do wrong. I think we, we needed some new life support into those. The work of Flemmy Winston, David <coughs> Carlos, many others. Uh, <clears throat> feedback dialogues. Feedback isn't feedback unless it's acted on, unless it's used, unless it causes action to occur. And that really has to be a dialogue. We've had dialogues all the way through human history rather than just monologues. And the is on basically feedback literacy, helping students to become able and willing and to benefit from feedback in all sorts of forms, in written forms, in face based form, in online form, etc. Lots of institutions are acutely aware of the need for students to be work ready, employable, whatever we like to call it. And I think Australia uh, has been a lead in this. What can we do while students are with us here to make them all the more able to take a place in the community outside? Extending that, there's a lot of talk now about global citizenship, actually helping students to be ready for life, not just a career, etc. And I think that's really, really important. Finally, these eight paradigm shifts, there's an increasing tendency <coughs> for recognition of teaching qualifications, teaching experience to be regarded mm -hmm. highly by institutions in league tables and various other things. And Sally will we'll talk about the fellowship scheme, the HA fellowship scheme, which uh, you really started off in many ways. And many, how many of you are working towards some measure of your teaching excellence, your teaching ability? So that was, a, I think, the summary of the changes that are going on at the moment, the changes that are going on quite rapidly at the moment in higher education. Old Einstein quote that I love to use. <coughs> You can't address these paradigm shifts by just doing the same thing as we've always done. We've got to do other things, we've got to do things that are different, we've got to change how we use the resources we've got, how we use the media we've got to make learning happen. Whenever I use an Einstein quote, of course, one isn't quite sure it is Einstein. If you go onto Wikipedia, you can find uh, other possibilities that you might have said, etc. But whatever it is, I think it's quite a sensible quote. <coughs> well, I, I carry on writing, and some of you have seen in the deep end, I made a slightly bigger version of that, including some of the things in chapter six there, um, in the fifth edition of Lectures to Good, which doesn't have a chapter on online learning now, and that is supposed to be published <coughs> as well. So fingers crossed it'll be available. And on my website, there's a flyer you can download, which has a 20% discount if you order it online. So uh, don't, don't pay a full price, whatever you do. <laughs> right. <coughs> and we'll get the new edition of the is based on three questions that I think are always in student mind. Three questions students come to the large group sessions with, they come to online learning with, etc. One of them. What will I be expected to be able to do with this? With this idea, with this concept, with this resource, with this video, with this presentation, etc. Students need and want to know what the expectation on them is. And I think this is true internationally. 
students have always got this at the back of their mind. The second one is whatever it is they want to do. <coughs> what does a good one look like? Or what does a bad one look like? Now we're quite good at sharing what the really good things look like with students. But that doesn't really do it doesn't cut it as it were. They need to see what a bad one looks like as well. So that they know what the range is. The work of Roy Sadler in Australia, if you show students the range, they will if you just show them the good, they will copy the good. So we've got to give them the idea of what the range is. You might wonder, how do we show them bad things, bad essays, bad presentations, bad lab reports? In my experience, students are only too willing to write a bad job. As long as we promise, we're not going to it. If you say there are prizes for the three best bad ones, <laughs> along with the good one that you hand in, you get some really good bad ones. <laughs> now, that students tell me, actually, it helped us to write the bad one. Because every time we put something in the bad one, we made the good one better. We made sure we weren't doing that then. So get students to make deliberate mistakes, and they enjoy it as well. Third question, surprising. <laughs> career, my plans, my learning, etc. And I think we've got to look around the room for our students with those questions in our minds on their behalf. How can we address those questions with students as we go? Teaching, learning and enthusiasm. Knowledge, sadly, isn't infectious. Enthusiasm is. We need to Cause that question to be caught by students from our own enthusiasm about what we're doing and about the situations we're in. And we certainly don't want teaching and assessment to damage the actual enthusiasm that students have. And it does happen, I'm sure you'll show that yourself. What have we got face to face with a group of students? What have we got face to face that we haven't necessarily got online? Those are some of the things. <laughs> some of those are online, of course, with videos that you can see and hear as well. Some of which body language, facial expression, all that sort of thing. What is our job with students? This is one way of putting it. That could be called constructive alignment, joining up the learning outcomes to the evidence of achievement to the assessment criteria. The trouble is, that's in a foreign language, foreign language to students. It's a language I call academies. More about that in a moment. But many of these tools don't work just on paper, don't work just on resources. We need some sort of face-to-face -face or simulated face-to-face -face, um, medium to do that. But back to the bit at the top, what does that actually mean? And I think you can probably guess. I've asked students what that meant, and it means answers to their questions. That's the first one. What was the second one? Well done. And what was the third one? I think addressing those questions achieves that, whatever that means. <coughs> what are the things words in responding to where students are, where we want them to be, and so on? Well, students naturally want to know why. Question of why things are happening, why they're doing this, why it's important, and so on. I've put in smaller print now because what is available at the touch of fingertip on a phone or etc. Information is everywhere around us. Another Einstein saying knowledge is experience. Everything else is just information. And I'm I'm worried sometimes that information gets out of 
con control at the context. So I put what is known, that's the content of the course, like the content of the module. That's ever so the course is still there. Who? The students, us, employers, customers, whoever. We're in a crowded planet. We need to interact with each other successfully. Where and when have changed a lot. There's all the sorts of things we can do 24 7 that we didn't used to be able to do before. But where and when are still important to students? In? Where, where am I going to do my learning? When am I going to do this? Etc. Critical one. How? There's a lot being written about how learning happens over the last few centuries. I'm not satisfied with much of it, as some of you will know. Uh, I think there's, uh, we need to look again how learning really happens, and I've been doing this for the last 20 or 30 years. Which decisions? So what? What's important? Students really need to map what's important. We answer to their three questions to help them do this. Looking for a ninth one, the wow factor, or the aha moment in the moment's goal, etc. The wow factor. The things that I mean, if you think back to when you were a student and I asked you to find a location where you had the wow factor, it left you changed, it left you developed your life. You would probably all think of it. So one more important word that I add to this list. Have any of you seen me do this before and know what this word is? No. <clears throat> What I call the else factor. <coughs> Why? Why else? Why else else? What? What else? Probing questions. If you ask a group of students why something happens, they'll give you some reason. Then if you say, why else does it happen? You'll get some more reason. And why else does it happen? You'll get yet more. That gets students thinking out of the box. Going back to that Einstein statement, not doing the same thing. Particularly, how? How does something happen? How else can we make it happen? How do we presently assess students? How else could we assess them better, etc.? We can think about all of these things. So, factors underpinning how students learn. Now, over the last 20 odd years, I've asked six questions in many, many contexts, many countries, many disciplines to identify in straightforward language the factors underpinning successful learning. And these are the seven that keep coming up. You could call this intrinsic motivation, but that sounds cold and psychological. We all know what it is to want something. And if students want intensely to learn, they will succeed. If they don't want to learn, there's not a lot we can do for them. <laughs> but this is coupled with needing to learn. If students really, really need to learn something, they will succeed, even if they don't want to. I used to teach thermodynamics. It is not normal to want to learn the laws of thermodynamics. <laughs> But it is perfectly normal to need to learn it. That's what I used to say to my students. Nobody wants this, but we do need it. You know, open doors for it, get you places, this sort of thing. So we've just got to get on with that. But if we want to and need to learn something, well, that works. That really works. We ideally want that to happen. We want to enable students to be in that position. But nothing at all happens until there's some doing some action. Got to get students doing something, trying something, thinking something, testing it, making mistakes, anything, experience. We want them to get their head around it, making sense. A very powerful tool in making all this happen is feedback. I don't actually like the word feedback as much as the word feed forward, but it's a bit more clumsy, but it's the things that help you do better next time. Well, the feedback dialogues that, that <coughs> Carlos and Nicol and various other people talk about. <coughs> then, 
Well, a long way. I used to use the word teaching then, but then changed it over here. I'd like you all to think back to something you've taught for a long time now. But think back to the first time you taught it. One of the six questions I ask people is, after you taught it that first time, did you have your own head around it better? Very much better raise two hands, somewhat better raise one hand, no change, just left ear. <laughs> a lot of hands up, not many ears being touched. Right, good. We, we all know that if we explain something to someone, we know it better. Now, we get a lot of practice at explaining things standing on this side of a room like this, but we need to give our students the practice at explaining things to each other, getting them having those dialogues with each other online or face to face. So, near me. <coughs> But there's one even sharper one. Making judgment, assessing. If we get students making judgments on their own work, making judgments on each other's work, they learn a lot about the content just by doing that. If you gave students a pile of 200 reports, essays, whatever, and said, find the best ones, find the worst ones here, they start doing it. And they would learn a lot about the content while doing that. We've got to help students to be assessing their own work as they do it, learning by testing. Now, these aren't separate, separate things at all. They all interact with each other. Globalizing, we're making sense of things, we're increasing the want and need to get a group, etc. So, for well, quite a while, I've drawn them like this. Um, as ripples on the pond and you know, with everyone affecting each other. But Paul Kleinman emailed me and said, I like what you're saying about these seven things, but I don't like the lines in between. And I absolutely agree. It's very easy for me to get rid of the line. But it's still not right, is it? So Paul Kleinman said, well, I can't draw it the way I have it in mind. And Paul Kleiman sent me this one. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is a way of thinking about the wanting, the needing, the making sense, the doing, etc. Every student has a different brain in a different place. Michelle Morgan in her work talks about students being completely different. We need to communicate with as many of them as we can on their own terms, in their own way. What we can try to do is to stir up all of those factors I've talked about. So that they're all <coughs> ways of intensifying them and making them better as they go. So back to health. <coughs> what else can we do? <coughs> Assessment and feedback work. What else can we do to use the tools we've got at our disposal to enhance students' want to learn? What else can we do to help students develop ownership? Ownership is such a crucial word. If students have designed assessment criteria themselves, and then they're trying to perform against their own criteria, they do so much better than if they try to perform against criteria we've designed or we've given. We need to help students feel that sense of ownership in the time. We're pretty good at this. How can we best keep students engaged, doing practice, trial and error, repetition sometimes? This is the one that David Winston and David Carlos are particularly keen on for their new book. So there's an awful lot of light on this. How can we best make feedback work for students so that they're benefiting from it, they're taking action on it, they're making judgments on it, they're using it to influence their future work. But we've got a long way to go. What are the best ways of helping students to get their heads around things? And going back to the very colourful diagram, they'll all do that in different ways. They'll all do that with different other factors. We've got to make as much of that possible as we can. <laughs> One that we often miss out on. 
students can be quite lonely, even in large groups. So we need to get them talking, we need to get them debating, we need to get them discussing, we need to get them arguing. That's a way of encouraging them to verbalise. I used to say to my own students, uh, when you're getting ready for an exam or something like that, don't just read it, don't just write it. Talk it. Talk to anyone who will listen. You'll get your head around it that way. And if you run out of people who will listen, buy the dog. <laughs> to the dog. Explain it to the dog. <coughs> the student came back to me. She got a first class law degree. And she said it was a dog that worked. <laughs> she quickly ran out of human beings who had listened to her talking law. But the dog would look at her intelligently, fixedly, while she made sense of things. And she said in the exam, she saw her question, it was easy. I'd explained this to the dog just last week. I wrote that the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and so that if you pass this on to your students, do not try this with cats. <laughs> cats already know it. <laughs> what are you telling me this for? It works with dogs, but not cats. And the final one. This is, I think, where we've got maximum room for developing things as well. You know a lot more about the benefits of getting students to make judgments, the benefits of getting them to engage with criteria, in, indeed to formulate criteria. We need to be doing that to help all of the rest of that. So that's a, a picture of the paradigms and some of the ways ahead that we can actually try to get there. Now, Sally and I will take questions when we, we've got finished, but I'm going to pass them to Sally now. Good work, Grandpa. Uh, <laughs> Ellen and I do a lot of co-grandparenting with quite a lot of grandchildren, and we're great believers in the positive power of reinforcement. And you finished on time, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, where I'm picking up from Phil is building on all the dimensions he put us there, and wanting to remind you that. All the references we've used, everything that he's talking about, Winston and Carlos and Baum, all those kinds of people, they're all at the end of the presentation. Um, I'm going to now think about what constitutes excellent teaching. And Phil, just tell me, why have you got a badge? What's this badge? Uh, I've got it because I'm not, I'm not allowed out without it. You're not allowed out without it's it, but badge. Phil's a National Teaching Fellowship. Um, winner and National Teaching Fellowships is a UK scheme and this is a means by which we recognise outstanding teachers <laughs> and it's a very important movement to me because um, I, I chair the Association of National Teaching Fellowships for a bit but also because you'll be pleased to hear I agitated and agitated for years until Scotland joined the scheme so and I'm delighted that now there are starting to be Scottish winners. So, what does constitute excellent teaching? What constitutes inspiring teaching? Now, we were told it had to be a presentation that could be sent all around to all the campuses, but I just want you to think for 30 seconds or less about the person you remember from your own teaching who inspired you. I just want you to think about that, whether you're in Dubai or whether you're in Malaysia or Gala Shields or in Orkney or here in this room. I'm not going to ask anybody to say anything. Just shut up and listen to your own thoughts. Inspiring teacher. And stop. Because some of the characteristics that the literature tells us that are the characteristics of outstanding teachers. And there's lots of literature that I've used, uh, Bain, Bings and Tang, Ramston, lots of other people looking at international um, sources on this. And these are the things that come up most of all. And as I see <coughs> of them, I would like you, if you were thinking about a teacher who had this, I'd like you to say yes or hurrah, or if you just want to do a little ladylike wave, that's fine. Okay, so the person who inspired me really knew their subject inside out. Yeah. And I'm trusting you're joining in in Malaysia and, and uh, in uh, Dubai. Adopted a scholarly approach to the practice of teaching. That is, they researched how teaching happens. Fewer, 
<coughs> viewer, and yet in the UK, as in Malaysia, as in Dubai, and many other nations, we're all taking that a lot more seriously. The person who taught me, who was fabulous, don't just keep churning out the same thing year after year. That person was reflective and looking to continuously improve. Yes, to some extent. And that's what things like the postgrad cert, the PG cap, gives to people is the opportunity to think about how you do it. Is well organized and plans the curriculum effectively. Yep. Yes. Yeah. They weren't chaotic, were they? They turned up on time and didn't say, where were we up to last week? <laughs> Although some of us did have teachers who did that. Now, it's what new lecturers often concentrate on, but it's actually one of the factors, it's probably not the most, is passionate about teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Now, funnily enough, if you ask students <laughs> which is the most important one of this lot, they'll often come up with passion. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to people about the people who taught them right from primary school right the way through, the passion for teaching is what comes through. Actually, number six, cares about students, has a student-orientated approach. Yeah. 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 Not the ones who teach doing this on purpose like this. <laughs> Pauline Neal was telling us about somebody, Pauline Neal at Plymouth University was telling us about somebody who taught her who used to teach with a blackboard rubber in one hand. So he's writing on the board with one hand, wiping it off with the other. <laughs> so that he could always be sure that everybody was writing down every word he said. <laughs> he said which, rather than it being the logo-centric approach, we'd like it student-centered. Somebody who's thinking regularly about what really is working in teaching and the innovations in learning and teaching tries to add relevant ones to their own context. Hmm, maybe, because some of the greatest teachers aren't the greatest innovators. And when you're looking at schemes like the UK PSF, National Teaching Fellows, it's not innovation that's the most important thing. What about making sure assessment practices are fit for purpose? Because as David Bowen says, you can survive poor teaching. You can't survive poor assessment. Is that true? Mm -hmm. And then the final one demonstrates empathy and emotional intelligence. Yep. Yeah. 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 And that tends to be one that comes across very much both among students and among academics as being important. But my guess is that when you were thinking about an outstanding teacher, they had at least four of those. Yes. And the balance is going to be different depending on your subject area, your context, and what kind of person you are as a learner. Now, how do we know, John and colleagues, if your university is offering excellent student experiences? Well, I'll start off with the bottom one, John. You don't have a lot of complaints. You don't have a lot of people turning up and going to court and saying it's awful. That is trivia, although it's 40,000 pounds of time trivia, but students are satisfied, learn well, achieve highly, and have fulfilling learning experiences. That's what we're really aiming for, isn't it? Students have a range of competences they need, problem solving, self-management, that actually take them, not just through their degree, to a degree success, but into academic <laughs> and life afterwards. So what you might call citizenship. I think that's one of the things we're needing to do. And we, as teachers and academics and professional staff, are satisfied, motivated, and find our workloads manageable. And the quality assurers and enhancers are happy with what we do, professional subject bodies and so on. And also that we are happy with what we do. So those are the things we're aiming to do. And John and colleagues don't get loads of grief. Yes, that's what we're aiming to do. I mentioned the National Teaching Fellowship Scheme before, and I did it because when I set up the scheme for the UK, which is still a UK only scheme, but universities which have staff who are full time and who are contributing to the university as a UK based university are eligible to be nominated. Here are they, and you can see them on screen or on the slides afterwards, but I'm just going to paraphrase. Number one, can you hack it with students? Do you make good work with your students? Does it feel energizing and positive? Number two, do you do that locked in a private room all by yourself? 
or do you share your good practice with other colleagues, either through mentoring or supporting or just being really helpful to new colleagues or through publishing or presenting at conferences? Do you actually disseminate what you do? And the third one is, do you take yourself seriously? And do you take reflecting on your own practice seriously? And you'll see that closely relates to the list of nine from beforehand. And for me, I can't talk about learning and teaching without talking about assessment. If you cut me in half like a stick of rock, you'll find assessment for learning, strictly speaking, right through my whole body. Because as Phil was indicating by his <coughs> model of learning, and I believe too, it's actually through the assessment, the ways in which we organise assessment, that we can actually make learning really happen well. And when we look at people like John Biggs and Catherine Tang and their work, <laughs> constructive alignment, which simply means that we design programmes and the learning outcomes that are the physical representation of those learning programmes and the way we teach and the way we assess all come close together and actually work as a single entity. That's what constructive alignment means. And we need to do it and we need assessment that is constructively aligned. We also need students to learn through formative and summative assessment. Summative assessment is like summing up, it's like a judge making a decision. Summative assessment is principally terminal at the end of a programme. And its main purpose is judgment. The main purpose of formative assessment is to change students' practice. If it doesn't change them, if it doesn't inform and transform them, it's not worth doing. Formative assessment is mainly carrying lots and lots of words, whereas summative contains lots of numbers. So formative assessment, its principal purpose is change and it tends to be continuous rather than just on a single occasion. That's what works. And we need to make sure that our assessment uses a range of tactics just sticking, I might say, to two forms of assessment, multi-choice questions and final exams with no feedback, doesn't work. We know that from experience. So we need a way, range of ways of assessing students because students, as Phil's pointed out, are diverse and they come at what they learn in different ways. And if we keep doing it in a narrow way, we'll just replicate the kinds of outgoing persons that we've had over the years. We need to enable students to demonstrate their capacity using their own best abilities. And we need students to understand how the system works. We need students to be assessment literate. That is to say, to have an understanding of what criteria and weightings and the language we use around assessment like condonement or all those kinds of areas, we need them to understand that. And hence, this afternoon, uh, when I'm Gala Shields, we'll be playing with that concept. So, formative assessment, summative assessment are done. So now I want to go directly to the assessment for learning Northumbria model. This was devised by Kay Samble, Liz McDowell, Catherine Montgomery and others based on some work that Liz and I did back in the olden days. And basically what the Northumbria model says, we need assessment that is authentic and that's well aligned and productive. We need plenty of formative assessment, low stakes confidence building, but not much summative assessment. We need summative assessment to be rigorous, but sparing. We need lots of feedback that's coming from the tutor and from the students in their self-review. And we need lots of informal feedback coming from collaborative work, peer review, and those kinds of things. But the key thing, as Roy Sattler would say, is we need students to develop a concept of the quality of their work that broadly accords with that of the assessor while they are actually doing it, not afterwards, so that they're actually knowing how they're doing. And aligned to that is Sattler's concept of dialogic assessment, which I think underpins an awful lot of the work that a lot of us build upon. 
And he said they need to say, as Phil indicated, that students need a variety of works of different quality, planned rather than random exposure, the opportunity to make judgments about quality. They need verbalised rationales and accounts, and they need to take part in evaluative conversations. So we need assessment for learning that works to help students practice. So the task should be challenging, demanding of high order <coughs> learning and skills, but also integrated within the context. The learning and assessment shouldn't be separate things. It shouldn't be stuck on at the end. It should be integrated. And students need to be involved in self and peer adjustment uh, assessment so they become competent at making judgments. They need tasks that involve metacognition, that is thinking about thinking and learning about learning. And assessment needs to be formative so they can act on it. And it needs to be given early enough so that students, having read your feedback, <coughs> can then go on to do something about it. We need to make sure that students know what the rules of the game are so that assessment <coughs> expectations need to be visible. And the task shouldn't be passive work. There should be active <coughs> engagement. We're not interested in just getting them to repeat what we poured out to them. We want them to be engaged in activities that reinforce their learning and learning that is worthwhile. If we want to find out whether a man can ride a unicycle, do we ask him to write a set of parts of the unicycle, a history of the unicycle, a set of instructions on how to mount a unicycle, or do we ask him to actually ride a unicycle? That is a metaphor. Think when you're designing your assessments whether you're actually unicycling. And then we need fit for purpose assessment that works and we need it to line up with the learning outcomes. And we also need to find out from our assessment how we ourselves are doing as teachers. If we do all that, we've got a reasonable chance that assessment will work. So coming on then to some practical tips on how to inspire learning. We need to teach thought. <coughs> we all do. When you first started teaching, the main thing you worried about was whether you had enough content, wasn't it? <laughs> Just wave at me here and wave in your own rooms in Dubai, Malaysia and elsewhere. If when you first started teaching, you sometimes found you had double the content you needed. <laughs> wave at me. The content is less important, we learn, than the process, isn't it? Because as Phil says, we can access <coughs> content in a million ways. Sometimes a YouTube video or a TEDx talk is going to say it goes <coughs> to me. And then we know that students might well go to those. So let's have a think <coughs> about how our learners are learning, building on Phil's work. <coughs> and if you get asked a question you can't answer, be honest about it. Do you remember that? I first, first teaching I did in higher education, I was asked a question and I made it up on the spot. What a foolish thing to do. There are people in the audience who knew far more about it than me. But I thought I had to be the fount of all wisdom. And it was only later that I said, that's a great question. I'll have a think about it. You have to think about it. And let's go from there and pick it up next week and then stick to our promises. Think as much about how you structure the activities as you do about the content and make convincing links between what you're teaching students today and what you've done previously. So they have a view of how, as Phil says, it all fits together and makes sense. If each separate session is presented independently, then the students will have difficulty making a coherent whole of it. And I call it plasticine or Play-Doh and elastic. Build into bits into each session you're teaching. So if you find you're running out of time, you can give them an activity to do. This goes back to when I did supply teaching in school with little children and I could use Play-Doh or similar modelling clay while I was working out what they had in the cupboards. 
What I mean in the higher education context is some activities. It might be reflect for 30 seconds. It might be talk to your partner. Something that is going to give an opportunity for you to build it bigger if you've got loads of time or build it smaller if not. And that's what I mean by elastic. I can talk for 20 minutes about that assessment for learning wheel. I can do it in five if necessary. I regard that as elastic because it can stretch to fit. You might want to build into your classes some elastic. So we're building in flexibility. And we're thinking about learning outcomes. Now, learning outcomes can be absolute rubbish, can't we? When you look at the learning outcomes, they can be very <coughs> poor indeed. And Phil mentioned my vascular model, which you'll find not in this presentation, sadly, but in lots of others. But learning outcomes need to be verifiable. We need to, need to know whether the students have or have not achieved them, and so do the students. Learning outcomes need to be action orientated. That is leading to the students actually doing something. <laughs> learning outcomes need to be singular because sometimes people stuff two or three things into the same learning outcome. And that's really confusing when you come to decide whether the students done it or not. Learning outcomes need to be constructively aligned, a la John Vix. They need to be understandable by the validation panels, by your colleagues, by you and your students, which probably means not writing them in academies. Learning outcomes need to be level appropriate. That is, if you're talking about expecting students as part of a program to be able to communicate orally in writing through social media, etc., is that going to be different at the beginning of a degree program and from at the end of a degree program? Or are you asking them just to do exactly the same? <clears throat> and when you look at your learning outcomes for your master's programs, are they that different from top level of undergraduate program? So level appropriate, and they need to include the effective domain, not just what the students know and can do, but who they are as a professional, as a citizen. And finally, learning outcomes, if they are vascular, need to be regularly reviewed. So we need the learning outcomes to actually match the programs. Next one. Not everybody's got a loud, carrying voice. I do. I've had the drama training, darling. <laughs> However, even me, even in a modest room, even with a voice that can carry to small children across a playground, I will always use amplification because there might be somebody in the room who hasn't got full hearing and needs to use a loop. So we always use it when it's there, and if you struggle, you may need to take your voice a bit lower if you're a woman or higher if you're a man. <coughs> you need to make sure the breathing comes from here. There are lots of techniques for this, but work on making yourself audible and you need to be comfortable. So ladies, don't wear those brand new shoes on the first lecture or in a keynote without having worn them before it applies to gentlemen as well. But it does mean that we need to think about that and the learning spaces. Phil and I shot into this room first thing this morning before anything else, so we had a feel for the room. That's a good practice to do. Be confident in how you project yourself. I often talk to brand new lecturers and say, how about a magic jacket? A magic jacket that you put on for work that is your costume, that enables you to feel when you've got the jacket on, I'm a confident teacher. You might not be, but if you act it and behave it, you will be. And don't forget to give time within your sessions for people to interact and think. And this means probably never more than 20 minutes ago without giving people to have a thinking time, even if it's only a 30 second reflection. Nearly there at the end of the slides, but look at this slide. It's from Europe, it's from Italy, it's from the second half of the 14th century, and it's how many universities are still set up. Can you see? We can see students sleeping, <laughs> we can see students having private conversations. There's at least one student with an iPad there. Um, <laughs> Certainly need to be some cuddling up or um, something else going on there. 
The point I'm making, though, and Phil will be pleased to know that at the time available, I'm not going to stand on a chair to demonstrate it. Look where the lecturer is. The lecturer is in elevated and separate. And by being elevated and separate, you are making a point about the quality and the nature of what you're doing. That is, I own the book, it's chained to the lectern, I own the words, I'm transferring them to you. That is a model of teaching that is content driven, lecturer orientated, and I'd like to be in the lead of a Copernican shift which puts the students at the heart of the experience rather than the lecturers. So, visit the spaces, have a look at them, and think about your unpromising spaces, even your lecture theatres. Students can work in pairs and triads, although bigger than that doesn't work. And think about equally how you use online and virtual places so that students have opportunities to listen and talk to one another as well as to you. Don't be the Laurentian person up in the pulpit who is lecturing without making opportunities for students to interact. But more than anything, Phil and I have very different styles, you'll have noticed that. You've got to be yourself. You can't want to say, I want to be like Phil, or I want to be. You've got to be confident and comfortable in yourself and find your own way. If you're naturally funny, be funny. If you're not naturally funny, it's not essential. If you are naturally quiet, you need to project. If you're naturally interactive, go for it. If you're not interactive and you'd rather just talk to your own slides, I ain't going to hack it with students, so you have to get a bit beyond it. But don't do more than you feel comfortable with. And focus as much as you can, as Phil would urge us, on making the learning happen so that students do and how, know what students do and how they work with one another, rather than thinking that the sole responsibility of their learning lies with you. And there we stop. And we're going to take a couple of questions now. And I believe somebody might be picking up some questions from other campuses. That's you, is it, is it Suzanne? <coughs> Hopefully, yeah. Right. Have you got any questions from out there? In the meantime, any questions or comments from in here? Yes, please. Now, do I need to take him in order? No, right. Say who you are and speak up nicely. Please. <coughs> Thanks. Start? Okay, I'm David Finkelstein. I'm involved in both the economics and psychology unit. Uh, I have a question which relates to culture. That's one mm. thing that wasn't talked about here. Mm. Also, you talked about learning opportunities. Our, our tri quadruple quintuple mm. campuses operates in different zones and cultures. And I wondered whether that seemed to be something, well, that's something that I would suggest may also be very opposite when you're teaching is thinking about how you're how you reflect on the cultural differences or the cultural needs that students might bring to the spaces. Is, mm. Could you have some commentary on that? I do. Um, you may want to join in afterwards. I'm very interested in the differences in assessment between cultures. Little things like what a pass mark means. Pass mark in Britain is a 40. Pass mark in northern Sweden, where I worked in a med school, was 80%. They said to me, you need to say, you let people who failed more than half of everything become doctors. <laughs> no, 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 that's the benchmark, that's good enough. So yes, I'm interested in cultures of assessment. I'm also interested in cultures of presentation, because in some countries, bear with me, I'm doing this on purpose, actually moving very close to the audience, is quite common in North America and in much of the UK, but would be considered by many to be quite intrusive in some countries. So I think it lies aligns with being yourself, but be appropriate. And it aligns with what we might wear. Um, we've worked a lot in New Zealand. We've seen people teaching in board shorts and flip-flops and t-shirts. And that's you know the most senior people in the institution feels wrong to me, but 
is what their local culture is, and it's going to be different in Dubai and Malaysia. So I think you're right to pick on this. And if you want to think more about this, I'd refer particularly to the work of David Killick, whose work on intercultural uh, education is top right, and also Elspeth Jones. Phil, would you want to stand and add something to that? I think I'd like to take you back to that colourful slide I showed earlier with all the colours mixed up. Because we in a, a group of large group of students, there's all sorts of cultures there that we might know about, we might realise what's going on. And that's where I think the use of learning incomes is a lot more useful to us than learning outcomes in many ways. But one thing I used to do with students <laughs> is look at it each at the start of a session. And I'd say, what's the most important thing you already know about so and so? How do you feel about so and so? I get them to pass those around and then eventually send them to me, put them on the wall or whatever. I then knew a lot more about the cultural mix in that group. And I could respond to that, not to particular people at a particular time, but respond to the whole group, knowing it contained particular views, knowing it contained particular backgrounds. But learning incomes are ever so important, they're ever so easy to get from our students, orally, in writing, or whatever. And we can then tune in what we do, how we adjust the learning outcomes, to what they already know. There's nothing more boring for students than being told things they already know. And it happens a lot. That's my addition to that. Thing. Thank you. And let's see, have you any questions? Yes, please. Yes. So, <coughs> from Dubai. Um, how do you deal with students who are experienced professionals and are kind of full of cups, know it all? How do you inspire or convince them to be open to new learning? Hmm. Shall I start or will you? you start. I'll start. <laughs> Happens all the time, doesn't it? That actually, particularly when you're teaching mature students or you're teaching on professional courses, uh, very often the people in the room are very experienced. Uh, happens all the while well when you do educational development, Martha, doesn't it? Because people in the room are often people who've been teaching for 20, 30 years. And I think the main things that are going to enable people to engage and to think through ways of doing it differently are to be honest about your starting point. And in my case, if I'm going to say to people, I want you to stop assessing in the old boring ways that rely over much on unseen time constrained exams the only way i'm going to change people from that position is to provide them with bucket loads of evidence that shows from 40 years of scholarship on learning and teaching that there are other ways of doing it that work so that's why for me in red on those nine things that exemplify great teachers, having a scholarly underpinning on what works, hence the title of the What Works Guide, having a scholarly underpinning is going to be able to help people think through why they might want to listen to your ideas and do things differently. But it isn't easy. But we have to bear in mind, we work in an academic context, so the way to persuade and change is through academic practice and the power of persuasion too. Anything to add? I think it's useful to start with some challenges as well. That's partly why I started with the paradigm, that we're all, we've all been in this uh, educational situation for a long time and know how we're trying to do it. And just to summarise the things that are going on that we're needing to address is a start there. And what I would love to have done if there'd been more time is to give you all some little sticky dots that you could, on a chart of those paradigms, put three dots beside the one that concerns you most at this time, two dots beside the next one, and one dot beside the next one. Then to have a look at how the picture works, what this particular group of professionals rated in terms of the urgency, the importance of actually addressing those, par those paradigm shifts. That using your experience, bringing that to bear on the framework of the, the actual challenges we have. And again, don't <coughs> ever ignore the expertise that they have and give them space to share it because they might know more than you. Next question from, from Malaysia this Thank time. You. 
Um, how do you prevent students from using their mobile phones during a lecture? <laughs> Phil, <laughs> Phil's got to start. <laughs> The hazard I didn't show is get your mobile phones out, switch them on, turn them to silent, and use the hashtag that's at the bottom of the slide so that you can tweet to the audience in the room and anyone else your thoughts, etc. as we I think students will use their mobile phones. If you say put them away, they just go a bit lower and uh, <laughs> you can turn this into active learning media. And I've used Twitter for a long time in session. It's really useful if you can have a separate feed with a screen in the corner with the tweets coming in and rolling down. Now, some of the tweets will be, you know, um, disrespectful, shall we say? <laughs> the students who make disrespectful tweets uh, are, tend to be shunned. But some will say, what do you mean by so-and-so? What's the word understand mean? And things like that. And we've got to stop by 10 past, absolutely. So I want to add something to that. I want to add Mentimeter. Poll everywhere and all those other things for encouraging activity and also for an occasion where I got wildly ratty with an audience, an international audience, where people were on their phones and somebody said to me, you do never realise they're using Google Translate, don't you, Sammy? So let's not try and stop using phone, students using mobile phones. Let's give them things to do and recognise that they might be doing really constructive things. And if they're not doing constructive things, it's no worse than the old days when we used to write notes and pass them down, which could be just as disruptive. Martha, do we need to take one more question or do you want us to stop? <coughs> One more question. One from in the room. No, you've had one. Somebody else, please. Oh, no, sorry. I made a mistake. Oh, oh, right. right, off you go. And you are, sir. Hi, I'm Terry Lansdale. Uh, thank you for um, the thought provoking keynote. Um, I'm interested in, in the conflict about experiential learning. So I, I've got a syllabus defined by an accreditor. Um, I want to make my teaching more interactive, it's more than it is already. But I can put a theory across to the students in 10 minutes, for example. But if I try and design an activity to do that, it's going to take the whole session. I can't do that. So have you got any tips or suggestions about ways that we can get the students involved with experiencing theory, but, but this trade-off between time and practicality? Well, we can put a theory across in 10 minutes. And it's very easy for us to do that. Do we know that anything's happened with our students? Now, I go back to when I used to try to teach co vouchers law of electronic mobility in, in solutions. It's very boring, co vouchers law, and students have got it wrong time and time again, this sort of thing. And I found in the library co vouchers original data in 1881. And I reproduced this, and I gave it as an A4 sheet to everyone in the class. I said, here are some measurements of the ionic mobility, etc. What's going on there? In groups of three or four, just browse through this data and work out what's going on. That group came up with Kovacs' law within 40 minutes, and they never got it wrong. So we can get students to invent experience based on evidence, and I've done that ever since. And we can also, I'd love to see probably your 10 minutes worth of theory, but I'd like it not just as a one-off. I'd like you to do it in 10 minutes, maybe at the end of Phil's session, Phil's active session, and I'd like you to have a video camera on yourself, and I want you to have it forever for the students, because then they're going to be able to use it. I talked to a very, very competent Greek student who said to her teacher, I never, ever went to your lectures. I got them on lecture capture later. Because I'm an international student and I found it so much better to watch it seven times at home, start to start, check things, try things out. That was a much more efficient use of my time. Now, I'm not saying don't come, because I think what we should be doing in the classes is the kind of things, things that Bill's talking about that makes the classes so fabulous they're unmissable, but also to provide the backup of the kinds of things this marvellous Greek student was able to use. So don't do it every year. Have, a, have something you can use, but it's got to be yours. This is not replacing you. This is about making the time you have with them as productive as possible. Oh, sorry. 
We've got one more question from Malaysia. Can we squeeze it in? We can squeeze it in. Quickly. <laughs> so um, the question is, what do you think of the challenges of contract cheating students engaging external services to do their assignments? We're going to do this very quickly, Phil. <laughs> That's my big worry about written assessment. We can't mark it, we know from the research. We, we've all given things to the marks. And unless we have a face-to-face, -face, we don't know the certain who did it. We've got, in my opinion, to reinvent written assessment and get away from long written answers, long printed answers. Otherwise, contract cheating is enormously important. And the key references, Phil? Phil, Phil Newton at uh, Swansea University Medical School is uh, a smashing online paper that he's collected a lot of evidence together. And uh, Philip Dawson from Australia. Philip yeah. Dawson ran a workshop at the Assessment Higher Education Conference a couple of months ago, where he presented some evidence that were real assignments and contract cheated assignments, mm. and got us all to work out which were which. We couldn't. Mm. And just to add one more thing, I'll give you cyber invigilation. I'm working with a Danish country, a Danish company, who are looking at using retinal scanning linked to your laptop. Your laptop is locked down and only the sites they permit you to access are whitelisted. You're working in exam conditions with retinal scanning or in your home, but they know it's you and they employ a pair of uh, identical twins on their staff and they can tell them apart and that is the future. The posh name is remote proctoring, but I call it cyber invigilation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness, I don't know where to start, so thank you very much, Sally, for that tour de force that we've seen there. But it's my really great pleasure to offer you a word of thanks on behalf of us all, a most sincere word of thanks for all that you've said to us today. And what you said has certainly prompted me to rethink about um, how I came into teaching, why I came into teaching in the first place, and what I learned when I came into teaching. My very first teaching job, which was not here, uh, day one, the head of the department told me that I was going to teach the first year class, which was 300 students. And he said, the reason why, because it was much more easy to teach the first year class, wasn't it, than a difficult honours class. And um, I found out two things quite short time. One, it was not. <laughs> and two, the trick was to develop the skill to make difficult things sound easy, if you like, and not to burden people with a lot of coded words. And that's exactly what you've done for us today. I have lost count of the number of times when my eyes have glazed over as I thought, I think I know what they're talking about, but I'm not quite sure because of all the academic academies that has been used. Thank you for you know sparing us that. Thank you for the clear and concise uh, words that you have used to talk about some very deep things to do with learning and teaching to today. And the second thing that I learned in a lecture, particularly on first year class, and I think I've been typecast in this role for quite a few years, is they might not remember what you say, but they sure do remember how you made them feel. And you have made us feel enthused, you have uh, given your presentation with great good humour, great common sense, and for my part, you have made us feel good about learning and teaching here. And for all those reasons, many, many thanks for your session for us today. words. I know I'm not talking just to people in the room here, but all the campus locations as well. I do want to offer Sally and Phil once again our thanks for all the work that you've done with, with us to share, as you said at the start, to share all that stuff that you've written and that you have said as well. For those of you who haven't been onto the LTA website yet, there, go there, look at the films, and draw down the uh, worksheets and the guides and, and the rest. It is rich reading and you, you will uh, gain hugely from that. Now we also work our speakers hard here because Phil will be around in this room I think. 
and then next door or in a further room, J, J and wherever it is, Mum will tell us all of this. At about half ten, Sally is going down to um, fast car. Gamma in a fast car that you will uh, be there for lunchtime, I think, which is great. And a final word of thanks also to all those behind the scenes and in front of the scenes who have helped make this day work. This is a tough gig to join up all five campus locations at the same time. There's a short time slot in the day when we can do this. And this is the time, and we've been in that time. And it's been a great thrill to be able to do that and to do this in real time. But thanks to all those who have worked behind the scenes to make that so and to link things up. Thank you to Martha and the whole of the LTA team as well for this first day. If this is what we are to expect from the rest of the day, I think we have a real treat in store. We have made it to this point. We're across the line. I wish everybody at the Malaysia campus a good end to the day. Everybody at the Dubai campus a good middle to the day. And everybody else in the UK, um, it's the start of the day. And um, I hope it goes well. We have small gifts to give for you as well, um, which I will do now. Bill, this is a. This is for you. Thank you very much, Sally. This is for you. Thank you very much. And a round of applause.